Dear Chris, I want to pause for a moment. On the exact moment when my great grand uncle was speeding through the c h a p a r i a River on board a motor trawler towards the sea, there is a picture of him leaning over the edge of the small boat, looking outward. His eyes are squinted towards something outside the frame. It could have been the sun, but the brim of his hat already casts a protective shade. His mouth and cheeks are bunched up, as if he was drawing in breath, or chewing up his sentence. Altogether, it does not look like a comfortable expression. Clearly, not the serene gazing typically associated with looking out at sea. Yet, it does not quite express fear, but rather a mixture of confusion and discomfort. What did Brady see as the country of his desire slowly receded into the distance, while he himself moved forward? The ocean. He must have got away in a boat. I can't help but feel that this phrase from Yukio Mishima's "Runaway Horses" adequately describes my great grand uncle's flight. The ocean becoming the destination in itself, and the boat, the vehicle. Of flight. Of course, it was his decision to leave, going out of his way to ask for favors from friends to set him up. I want to leave the country as quickly as possible. Can you arrange it? He lied to his friend, an ex-British naval officer. It was not out of want, but imperative to leave the country. The only way to move in this situation. Is to abandon yourself to the motorized vehicle. The vehicle abstracts the body from its will, and like a cargo, he lets himself be transported away from his heart's desire. The linear progression of history dictates this inevitable severance. To move forward in time and space is to leave something behind. To look backwards while moving forward is to cast the future. As an inevitable repetition of the past, thus history progresses as a movement of return. I experienced a similar movement of severance the first time I left you. I was in a truck, speeding 90 miles an hour through the desert. I watched the familiar landscape, dotted with Suaro sentinels in the side mirror, disappear as I advanced. I pass from one desert to another, with low bushels this time. Everything that came after that break became a reenactment of the past. I learned the names of the desert plants that used to surround me in order to remember. Disparate elements of songs, tastes, and smells reconstitute memories of a place in time. It took Breedy a month and a half to arrive in the small port town of Xintao in Communist China. In that length of time, his gaze filled up with waves, and he was left to fill in the absence of the land desired with words. Historians Chris Baker and Pasuk Pong Pai Shit describe him as a man of action. Yet, it was in exile that Breedy truly became a man of letters. Words are the only weapons he can assert on reality, since he himself had become a political amputee. In his memoir, Ma Vie Mouvementée et Mes Vingt Ans d'Exil en Chine Populaire, he wrote an account of an incident that occurred while on board a steamer from Hong Kong. The captain mistook an approaching vessel to be a nationalist naval vessel and alerted the passengers to destroy any documents 
that could associate them with being a communist. In flurry, many passengers burned their documents in the boiler of the steamer's engine. Their fear, however, was unwarranted. The warship turned out to be British. A Chinese professor confided his regrets to Breedy that by throwing all his writings into the flames, he had lost volumes of his private journals that he had kept since he was a youth. I moved westward as far as I could until the desert became ocean once more. Beyond the horizon, the west ends and Asia begins. Remnants from World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, litter the coasts of the Western littoral. Across 5,475 miles distance, Asia somehow manifests itself on these shores, as if there was no break at all. In Philip K. Dick's novel, Man in the High Castle, it was natural that as the outcome of the Axis victory in World War II, Japan would occupy the western part of the United States, with California as its siege of government. History, of course, would have it otherwise. Empty bunkers and military museums, an entire suite of architectural constructions, destined for one purpose. To be a barrage contre le Pacifique. The Pacific Ocean is the ultimate barrier between the East and the West. These defenses are no longer needed. The enemy has been defeated. The Yellow Peril is neutralized. We are safe now. Tucked behind the Evergreen Shipping Terminal, Tuna Street as it intersects with Canary Street, is where the last buildings from the Japanese fishing village are still standing. The three buildings are brought up with plywood. Only a blank sign and a sign in Korean are visible. Upon closer inspection of the blank sign, the faint traces of the lettering, Fraser's Boiler 744, appear against the white background. On the other side, one discovers the spelling of restaurant in Japanese. The boiler company, now defunct, had replaced what used to be a sushi restaurant by the shore. More deciphered signs appear. In the space between two buildings, an array of bowls of water and cat food are left by a disused gate. A number of benefactors of such offerings prowl the area. Under constant drones of the generators coming from RVs, the street lifts on. Stack upon stack of shipping containers forms long shadows onto the street, an encroaching scale devoid of any humanity. The street dead ends into a wharf.
whenever I could, I would return to watch ships arriving and departing the San Pedro Harbor. I scrutinized their names painted in large across their bodies. Names not so different from the vessels that carried Bridi. Daichumaru, Sonyomaru, Nichumaru. Ever lunar, ever fit, ever fine. Our gazes crossed over the Pacific. Bridi's final voyage was a return to the Paris of his youth, where his revolutionary ideals were concretized. Toru, the 16-year-old protagonist in Yukio Mishima's final novel, The Decay of the Angel, had a job locking ships, coming in and departing the Japanese coast. Might he have seen through his telescope the ship carrying Brady from China to Paris in 1970? I returned westward instead of eastward. He could still not make out the name. He was sure that there were three characters, and fall knowledge told him that the first was ten. Heaven. もしもし、帝国信号です。天皇丸、信号所前通過ですからお願いします。君にですか。そうですね。半分ぐらいですね。217時から。もしもし、天皇丸3の G入りますか。もしもし、帝国信号ですけど、天皇丸3の G入ります。もしもし、税関ですか。刑務課お願いします。天皇丸3の G入りました。もしもし、16時15分3の G通過 もしもし、天皇丸5分前に入りました What of the happiness of watching the ocean? Upon being invited to a residency at the One Archives on USC campus, I started to be followed by a shipping container named One. Offshore, I encountered it on my commute home through Chinatown. Like a beach whale, the 20-foot-long container appeared out of nowhere in the darkness. Its pink skin paled in the yellow street light. During a short visit back to Thailand, it appeared again in short glimpses on the freeway. I understood perhaps more deeply the meaning behind Mishima's protagonist's musing. If seeing is a meeting between I and being, which is to say, between being and being, then it must be the facing mirrors of two beings. No, it was more. Seeing went beyond being to take wings like a bird.
when you start seeing everything becomes a quest. I requested a copy of the Decay of the Angel from the archives at one. The cover of the 1975 edition shows a container ship floating over cobalt blue waves encased in the face of a young man. What of desiring you, a white heterosis male, made me realize my difference. Against the stark whiteness, my brown skin radiates. Yukio Mishima's narrator, Shigekuni Honda, obsesses over the reincarnated form of his friend under the brown skin of the Thai princess, Ying Chan. I am not a Thai princess, I am a Japanese boy, the clairvoyant child exclaimed. The color of your skin bewilders me, as if I had not grown up among white people. I have seen the naked white male body before, yet somehow I haven't. I would ask the most naive of questions. Are other white men equally as hairless? Are these freckles from the sun? Your freckles spread across your shoulders and the nape of your neck down to your forearms. The skin on your face is burnished by acne scars. How does one ever come to associate whiteness with the supreme race when its skin is so fragile, so easily tarnished? As many Thais, I grew up believing that our country has never been colonized. Yet, we have freely given up our territory and self-determination to a foreign entity. The U.S. military's covert presence in Thailand in the ensuing Cold War is an ideological trade-off. The king, Bumibon Aduyade, Rama the Ninth, was made into a deity ruler to ward the country against the specter of communism. In return for monarchical rule, the U.S. established their army base on Thailand soil against the communist bloc, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Korea and China. Japan, on the other hand, got their nationalism squashed after World War II and suffered under American rule for a decade. The US backed military coups kept the Thai people in check. In 1973, the student movement in Thailand that overthrew the military dictatorship sparked the first hope that a return for 3D might be possible. But the civilian efforts were brutally crushed three years later, when the military dictator returned and the paramilitary and the police joined forces to massacre the students in revolt. Reedy was stopped at the Shanghai airport by a young American vice counsel who wrenched his passport from his hands and unnoticed his US visa on the spot. The vice counsel, he learned later, was a CIA agent. It was the CIA which encouraged the reactionary Siamese police to arrest my wife and eldest son, who were in Bangkok during my absence, Brady writes. I have no rancor towards Hannah. I would simply like the American taxpayers to realize that the sums of money used for the petty expenses of the CIA correspond sometimes with the false reports on which basis decisions are taken, which are prejudicial to their interests of the Americans themselves. The movement of return is only instigated by the force that propelled it forward. What Brady saw was a resignation, an expiation. A country and continent that no longer exists except through the eyes of the West.
in this disorientation, we seek refuge in the epicenter of harm. <laughs>